Hello, I'm Matthew Weinstock, Senior Editor for Hospitals and Health Networks, and we're reporting to you from the 2011 Health Forum American Hospital Association Leadership Summit in San Diego. Thanks for tuning in to HNHN Daily's videocast series. On Sunday, Dr. Atul Gawande was honored by the Health Research and Educational Trust for his tireless work in reducing medical errors and improving quality of care, not just in the United States, but across the world with his work with the World Health Organization. And then on Monday morning, he delivered a compelling keynote address to the crowd here at the summit, in which he said that we are in a battle for the soul of American medicine. I'm joined today by Dr. Gwande. Dr. Gwande, thanks for joining us. Thank you. In your keynote remarks this morning, you talked about cost as being the symptom of the pro part of the problem with the healthcare system right now and not the disease. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because there is so much attention to cost right now. Yeah, what I meant by that is that um, I think that the deepest part of our struggle for cost relates to making healthcare work when our difficulty is that the science of medicine has changed our job. Um, half a century ago, there was only a simple set of things that we really could deploy and do and it wasn't hard for institutions to be able to execute in quite the same level of demand that we now have to um, execute on. At the beginning of the 21st century, we've now accumulated a wide range of scientific capability. It's 6,000 drugs, it's 4,000 medical and surgical procedures, and a combination of them that varies and differs for patients who may have 13,600 different kinds of possible diagnoses that can afflict them. So what in effect we're trying to do is deploy 13,600 different kinds of service lines in every town to every person alive. There's no industry in the world that has to do this. Um, and it's something we find incredibly hard. The the problem of safety, the problem of quality, the problem of cost reflects our struggle to be able to um, do this job well, do it, get, get those capabilities to the right people at the right time in the right way um, without wasting resources. Some places are succeeding better than others. None of us have been able to do it in ways that actually lower costs even though when we look closely at any given area, whether it's a particular operation or a particular cancer diagnosis or a patient with diabetes, we recognize ways we could do dramatically better. And we see, obviously, a lot of uh, variation between cost and quality throughout the system, right? Yeah, the variation um, is where I think the hope comes from. Uh, I think that many places have feared the discussion of variation when to me the most interesting part is that there is a great degree of variability in the in the results that a person gets depending on where they go and there's a great degree of variability in the um, costs that they have depending on where they go but the bell curve for costs does not match the bell curve for results which is to say that the places that get the best results are not the most expensive places in the country they're often among the least expensive. And that means there's opportunity. If the best results required the absolute most expensive care, our only choice would be rationing. But here, if there's variation that recognizes there are some positive deviants, places that get better results with lower costs, um, then we can learn from them. We can investigate what their attributes are. And some of that some of those lessons, I think, are already starting to come through. So we've seen both through your work and other work in the Dartmouth Atlas that those institutions that are doing the lowest cost, best care, uh, is it that they're more efficient at what they're doing, more effective? What's the, what's the answer? Well, the, um, what seems to be emerging, and it's not just out of the Dartmouth Atlas, but a wide variety of studies in the U.S. and elsewhere, is that um, the places that seem to have the, that are most successful at, at driving towards the higher end of the quality curve, but perhaps being at the lower end of the cost curve, have some um, capabilities that other places um, haven't yet fostered. It, the, the best way I can describe it is that they function more like systems, that their, um, their care proceeds towards goals, that people are enmeshed and work together. Um, 
One of the really telling statistics for me was some, uh, a statistic that came from a leader at Johns Hopkins who looked at their hospital system in 1970 and found that to care for someone with a pneumonia, it was uh, an average of uh, just over two full-time people required, and, which isn't a lot of labor. But by the end of the 1990s, it was more than 15 full-time equivalents for the care of someone with um, that same diagnosis, uh, given the capabilities of care today. Now, do you need 15? Can it be fewer? Can they be organized better? The answer is turning out, out to be yes, uh, sometimes. And um, that the places that are most successful in making that group of people function as a team, as, as organized system of care, trying to move towards goals, are the places that um, are having the most success. Which is interesting. One of the remarks you had in your keynote this morning was this idea that the physician, the individual physician, can't do it alone anymore, that we had built a system really around the individual doc, but it's evolved to that now, right? That yeah, I called it going from cowboys to pit crews. Um, we have trained, hired, and rewarded physicians for, um, for being cowboys, being um, rugged individualists and going your own way. Um, but when you have 15 people who have to work together for the successful outcome of a patient, having all of them cowboys doesn't, um, uh, doesn't lead to successful care for patients and often leads to um, unnecessary costs and frustrations and, and difficulties. I think a lot of leaders in healthcare kind of understand this intuitively. They're trying to bring their surgery group, their cardiologists, their emergency room to really be able to be a great functioning organization and team for getting certain goals, lowering the, the infection rates, improving um, the outcomes and success of care, um, also uh, taking uh, unnecessary costs out of the system and finding it really hard. Everybody's not necessarily on the same page. They, they, they don't think that that's their job. They're not rewarded for it. Um, but we are seeing a, a big shift uh, just in the last few years of people becoming employed by the hospital system. And I think there's a younger generation of physicians who uh, see part of their job as helping the organization be successful at achieving its goals for patients. So what do you find then in those institutions that are doing it well are the uh, driving factors or the culture, if you will, of that organization that's making it work, that's bringing the team together? Yeah. Well, uh, I think on some basic level, it starts from the very beginning, which is how you hire and bring people in. Um, that you're bringing people in, you're selecting for not just their capability as an individual star surgeon, but also their capability for um, uh, being parts of successful teams that can make great surgical outcomes for all of the patients coming through. Um, and replicated across multiple other fields. And then it moves on forward to being a set of skills that I, I, I said there were four skills, being able to actually measure and monitor data that looks at meaningful goals that the team has. Second, being able to um, design solutions for the problems the data generates. Third, being able to implement them. And then fourth, I think, is a really important goal. Um, being able to create a portfolio of projects that add up to being genuinely better care at lower cost for patients. The, um, the reality is there's so many potential problems and projects to be working on that we're kind of running off in lots of directions. And um, the recognition that being able to focus on our highest cost areas might also, might be the, the place to focus, um, gives us our best chance at extracting better cost and quality at the same time. You said in your remarks that you know hospitals are going to have to really improve their quality in a slash and burn mentality that we're hearing from from Washington and elsewhere. So it's very hard. Yeah. So what's going to be the challenge for hospital leaders in deploying checklists and improving teamwork and improving quality of care, all the while this cost pressure is driving down on them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of two things. It's a, it's a tension span that I'm worried about at, at one level because there is so much concern just about the financial viability of particular institutions that people will focus entirely on problems like, you know, 
what's our debt burden and what's our billing like and how do we drive the revenues up <laughs> and at the same time um, working on solutions that in the long run will be about changing the whole model so that you're driving the inpatient revenues down and trying to create an ambulatory structure that works for you and when it's cut it's in a system of cutting it's very hard to, to shift so for attention span the thing that I um, am hoping comes out of this is that people can focus in on the 5% of patients that cost the 50% of the total dollars in healthcare. That group of patients has only a small number of priority areas to be able to, to focus on. Um, they include uh, trying to uh, improve case management so that they are um, not having to use the ED and the hospital quite as much. It includes a really hard area, which is being able to um, look at our patients with terminal diagnoses and being able to foster a culture that makes sure that when we've reached that point of futility that we have had real discussions about people's goals of care and are interested in helping them come to a very hard decision, um, like uh, deciding that they don't want to spend that end time um, in ambulance rides and in the hospital. Right. Dr. Grande, I appreciate your time today. Thank you. I'm Matthew Weinstock, Senior Editor for Hospitals and Health Networks. And for continuing coverage of the Health Leadership Summit, be sure to check your email on Wednesday and Thursday for h and Daily. Thank you.